Well, my, my cup runneth over, Clarence, and uh, um, I, I had to think of something funny to say because I didn't want to dissolve in uh, melancholy and nostalgia here. So I was reflecting back on when I first got into politics and I would go over to Clarence's house to urge him to endorse me and write something about me. And he'd say, you know, I would really love to, but I'm a journalist, so I've got to stay objective and neutral and write down the line but Lisa can endorse you, and I'd say, that's even better, okay? Uh, so I had, I had Lisa Page out there too, but I, I love the pages, and uh, clap if you love the pages too, like I do. So, um, so to uh, Clarence and um, Leanne Potter and Marcy Brané and Sarah Alex and Judge Carolyn Lerner, and Kitty Kelly, all of the distinguished journalists and cartoonists uh, assembled here, all you fine Herb Locke friends and family and First Amendment people. Thomas Jefferson, if you're in the house, someplace out there. James Madison, uh, all the library staff. Uh, what a great, fantastic honor it is to be with you all uh, on this wonderful occasion of the award of the Herb Locke Prize. Um, and I should say this is the first speech I've given since I got to ring that bell over at Georgetown Hospital. So, uh, um, but all of which is to say, settle in, because I got a lot to say tonight. Uh, you know, and as a local kid who grew up on the Washington Post, um, I would say that no one was more important in that great newspaper to me as a kid. Uh, than her block. I mean, it was the only part of the editorial section I could understand. Uh, and uh, so to me, he was right up there with Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, um, three iconic figures intertwined as in my mind as patriots of the truth and defenders of democracy against corruption and propaganda. Um, and uh, actually, I got a little bit nostalgic listening to Leanne Potter talking about the Watergate break-in, which seems like a Cub Scout prank compared to what we've lived through. Um, I wanted, um, I want to recognize a few people who I invited to come with me who are activists with Moms Demand Action, uh, Melissa Ladd, Nicole Hollywood, and Casey McCowie. So they came from Maryland and to join me tonight because I'm talking about the Second Amendment. I also should say that my wife, Sarah, is here with me tonight. And uh, um, as I was sitting there, I had a laugh because I was invited, uh, you know, I decided I was going to talk about the Second Amendment and gun violence and democracy. And um, um, the inviters kindly said, just come and give us all your wisdom about it. And I thought back to like a long time ago, it was probably 20 or 25 years ago, I had a similar invitation from Justice Kennedy at the Supreme Court. I'd written this book about um, the Constitution and public education called We the Students. And Justice Kennedy invited me to come and he said, come and give a, the, the justices and the clerks all your wisdom about the Supreme Court and public schools. And so uh, I told Sarah she had to come because she never comes anywhere to see any of my speeches. Um, and I said, but you know, they invited me to give all my wisdom and the justices are gonna be there and everything. And so uh, we went down and we were, you know, in the, that little, you know, the, the chamber off of the, the courtroom and the justices were there, a bunch of them and the, the clerks. And so I got up and I, you know, they had just kind of helped my book and I was talking about the book and so I, retired to what I thought was more than polite applause, but I sat next to Sarah and then uh, I said, so what do you think, how did I do? And she said, well, um, I don't know how much wiser they are, but they're definitely older. Uh, <laughs> so then I was thinking about that tonight because she came back again and uh, 
Well, anyway, thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> co congratulations to the phenomenally creative uh, Ann Telmis, um, who's... Uh, I, I would say that her uh, multimedia skewering of uh, the autocrats and the theocrats and the kleptocrats and the demagogues and the coup plotters and insurrectionists already puts her in the pantheon of great American cartoonists and satirists like Gary Trudeau and like uh, Herb Block and Art Spiegelman. So may, may, your, uh, may your enemies and your targets continue to cower and hide uh, for a long, long time. And, um, her bracing vision invites us all to act with zeal today to defend American democracy against its enemies. And this event has inspired me to elaborate how modern day insurrectionism threatens the structures of constitutional democracy and the American social contract. Now, the problem of insurrection has been with us for a long time. In the very first Federalist paper, Hamilton warned of operators who pandered to the violent passions of the mob in order to take power and then destroy the freedoms of the people political cult leaders who begin as demagogues, said Hamilton, and end as tyrants. In his famous Lyceum Address of 1838, Abraham Lincoln um, delivered a speech after the murder of abolitionist newspaper editor Elijah Lovejoy in Alton, Illinois, by a racist mob. And in that speech, Lincoln denounced mob violence and observed that if division and destruction ever came to America, he said, it would not come from some monstrous power abroad. It would come from within our own country. And when the Confederate Rebellion did come, Lincoln sent a message to Congress on December the 3rd, 1861, in which he described the insurrection as, quote, a war upon the first principle of popular government, the rights of the people, specifically the voting rights of the people and their right to choose their own leaders. Well, insurrectionism is back again today. It exploded in our face on January 6, 2021, when a demagogue tyrant galvanized a violent mob to block the peaceful transfer of power and to install the loser in the election over the winner. More than 1,000 people have been charged with crimes in connection with the attack. More than 600 have been convicted or pled guilty to a wide range of offenses from assaulting federal officers to seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow or put down the government of the United States, to obstructing Congress in its work. But insurrectionism is back not just as a practice, it is back as a theory of politics and a constitutional justification for unlimited availability of guns and an excuse for 24-7 gun violence in our society. This insurrectionist theory must be confronted and put down today just as the insurrectionist violence of January 6th was confronted and put down by the Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police Department so heroically on January 6th. Now, insurrectionism dresses itself up in the language of populism and constitutionalism, but it is a strange populism that seeks to overthrow the majority will, either to, expressed in votes or through the Electoral College, and it is a very strange constitutionalism which thoroughly twists and destroys the text and the meaning of the Constitution in order to undermine public safety and tear at the foundations of our social contract. The basic conceptual question is one that every American can understand. The First Amendment protects the freedom of speech, as Ann tells us, and the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. But do peacefully assembled protesters have an additional Second Amendment right to take up arms against the government and proceed to engage in violent rebellion and insurrection if they believe the government is acting unfairly 
or tyrannically? Well, astonishingly, most MAGA Republicans, including huge numbers of Republican members of the House, the U.S. Senate, and state legislatures, say yes. Following the longstanding dogma of the National Rifle Association, they've been promoting what I call the insurrectionary theory of the Second Amendment in the Constitution, a theory that was nicely captured by my colleague, Florida Representative Matt Gates, who said that the Second Amendment, quote, is about maintaining within the citizenry the ability to maintain an armed rebellion against the government if that becomes necessary. This view rejects as far too limited the Supreme Court's landmark five to four decision in the Heller versus District of Columbia case in 2008. There the court found that the Second Amendment protects the right of individual citizens to keep a handgun in the home for purposes of self-defense and the right to possess long arm rifles for the purposes of hunting and recreation. Heller itself broke from the traditional understanding that firearm ownership and possession were tethered to actual service in the military or service in what the Second Amendment calls a well-regulated militia, what we today call the National Guard. But the insurrectionary theory sweeps much further than even this. Dissatisfied with the idea that the purposes of the Second Amendment are limited to protecting oneself with a handgun for self-defense or using a rifle for hunting, the insurrectionist philosophy argues that the people, or to be more precise, any armed segment of the population with a grievance has a Second Amendment right to attack and overthrow the government of the United States. Colorado Representative Lauren Boebert put it this way, the Second Amendment, she said, is a protection against tyrannical government, and it, quote, has nothing to do with hunting unless you're talking about hunting tyrants, maybe. And these are not abstract concepts in her vernacular. She's described Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who you know suffered an assassination plot, as a tyrant. Um, Representative Boebert bemoaned the tyranny of Go Colorado Governor Jared Polis and defended the insurrectionist philosophy of the Constitution when I challenged her about it in the Oversight Committee. Now, of course, if the meaning of the Second Amendment is to empower the people or an armed subset to violently overthrow the government, the people must possess a military arsenal at least equal in quality and quantity to that possessed by the government. The people must never be outgunned by the government. And indeed today, there are around 400 million firearms possessed by citizens, an arsenal which dwarfs the number of guns possessed by the federal government or any state or local government or all of them combined. Furthermore, the insurrectionist thesis requires opposition to any regulation of heavy arms, such as military-style assault weapons like the AR-15, no matter how much the civilian carnage piles up from massacres at public schools, private schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, Walmarts, grocery stores, office buildings, and shopping malls. How could the people prepare to overthrow tyrants if they didn't possess weapons of lethality equal to those available to the army and the National Guard? Now, advocates of insurrectionism do not dodge this natural implication of their argument. On the contrary, they categorically and proudly oppose assault weapon bans, bump stock bans, or any legislation or regulation that would limit the power of the people to acquire military-grade weapons, declaring them all to be violations of the Second Amendment. My colleague and my friend, Texas Representative Chip Roy, who's savvy about the Constitution, contends that the Second Amendment is, quote, designed purposefully to empower the people to be able to resist the force of tyranny used against them. So any person walking into a church or a shopping mall with a loaded AR-15 is just exercising his Second Amendment rights commensurate with his right to repel the firepower of the government. But I want to show you how the claims of the insurrectionary theorists betray the actual Constitution and twist the Second Amendment into a pretzel of absurdity that not only excuses dangerous 
and fanatical political extremism, but blocks our ability to respond to the nightmare of random and arbitrary and daily gun violence in our country. So let's start with this basic reality check. Of the more than 1,000 criminal indictments brought against January 6 defendants for assaulting Capitol officers or for engaging in seditious conspiracy against the government or for interfering with the Congress, not a single charge has been dismissed on the grounds that the Second Amendment or any other part of the Constitution gave them the right to take up arms against the government to overthrow them, to overthrow officers that they considered to be acting in tyrannical fashion. And it's for an excellent reason that none of those charges have been thrown out against none of the defendants. Despite all of the romantic pseudo-revolutionary rhetoric about how the Constitution provides a right to civil insurrection, the actual Constitution in a half dozen different places treats insurrection and rebellion not as protected rights, but as serious and dangerous offenses against the Republic and against our people. So let's start with Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, which gives Congress the power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. This provision presents an unresolvable problem for the insurrectionists. How could Congress have the power to mobilize the militias to suppress insurrections if the people had a right to appoint themselves the militia and then engage in an insurrection against the government? Next, the Republican Guarantee Clause in Article 4, Section 4. It provides that the U.S. Congress shall guarantee a Republican form of government to the people and protect each state's government and the people of the states against invasion and domestic violence. Domestic political violence is considered a lethal threat to representative government, not a valid substitute for it. Both of these provisions became part of the Constitution in response to Shays' Rebellion, an armed uprising in Massachusetts in the 1780s, which the founders emphatically rejected and put down with force. So the militia, which the insurrectionists like to imagine exists as the people's organic reserve power to rebel against the government, is actually the well-organized instrument by which both state and federal governments have suppressed insurrections and opposed domestic political violence against our people. The Constitution thoroughly rejects the right-wing fantasy that random bands of disgruntled citizens can claim the powers of the institutionalized militia to commit violent acts against the government. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16 reserves to the states the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by the Congress. This intergovernmental cooperation is how we come to have what the Second Amendment calls for in its prefatory clause, a well-regulated militia. The Supreme Court has emphasized that this reference to a well-regulated militia means well-regulated by the government. In 1886, the Supreme Court upheld an Illinois law banning all private paramilitary groups and self-proclaimed militias as a danger to public peace and safety. The court explained that militia-related activities, quote, cannot be claimed as a right independent of law. Under our political system, they are subject to the regulation and control of the state and federal governments. The American rights recurring post-Oklahoma City, post-Ruby Ridge, post-Waco image of gun-bearing citizens forming a militia and taking aim at FBI agents and ATF agents reflects not a plan for exercise of God-given constitutional rights, but a dangerous fantasy of criminal violence and political terrorism. Today, all 50 states forbid private paramilitary groups, a blanket criminal prohibition which would be impossible if the Second Amendment authorized private militias to take up arms and start hunting tyrants whenever they disagree with the results of a popular election 
or a particular jurisdiction's public health policies. And I will go even further on this point. Far from being some kind of civic duty, raising arms against the government when it goes far enough is the definition of treason. Article 3, Section 3, Clause 1 provides that treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. What is a violent insurrection against the Congress of the United States and our Constitution if not levying war against our country? Yet the, the, the insurrectionary theorists invite us to treat treason as some kind of lurking constitutional right. There is no ambiguity anywhere in the Constitution about this. After the Civil War, participation in armed rebellion was made explicit grounds for excluding from public office anyone who had sworn an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and then betrayed the oath. Section 3 of the 14th permanently disqualifies from federal or state office those who engage in, quote, insurrection or rebellion against the United States, a provision that is, again, totally incompatible with the insurrectionist theory of the Constitution. Yet despite this overwhelming rejection of insurrection and rebellion and secession in the body of the Constitution, these theorists still insist that the Second Amendment, apparently in invisible ink, protects the right of the people to overthrow the government by force and violently resist police orders in the process. How can this be maintained when the Second Amendment makes no mention of insurrection or rebellion or sedition or secession. The insurrectionists must strike an originalist pose and imagine that the founders wanted the Constitution to give them this right. But nowhere did the framers express this belief, which is why none of these self-professed originalists offer any authentic evidence for these claims, nor did the Supreme Court ever hold during the Civil War that the Confederates had a right to try to, overthrow, oh, to try to overthrow the Union to defeat what they certainly saw as government tyranny. On the contrary, the court emphasized the government's power under the Supremacy Clause to enforce the law and quell the lawless insurrection taking place. And when I've pointed out the Constitution's comprehensive rejection of rebellious violence, my GOP colleagues fall back on two arguments. First, they invoke various quotations from Patrick Henry of give me liberty or give me death fame, which is amusing to me because, of course, Patrick Henry was an anti-federalist who voted against the Constitution. Um, so his slogans tell us next to nothing about the meaning of the Constitution. I know the George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School has a Patrick Henry professor of constitutional law. Um, but this modern day NRA romance with Patrick Henry as a guide to constitutional interpretation operates far more in the realm of mythology than it does in the realm of actual constitutional jurisprudence. The insurrectionary theorist will also invoke the American Revolution itself and point out to me that the Declaration of Independence posited that after a long train of abuses and usurpations, the people have the right to alter or abolish the bonds connecting them to a tyrannical government. And this is, of course, emphatically true, but it's also perfectly irrelevant. The American revolutionaries asserted their right as a matter of natural law to overthrow a tyrannical government, not their rights under the Magna Carta or British law or the non-existent British Constitution. Um, the fact that the American colonists asserted a natural law right to overthrow tyrants is completely different from the claim that they embodied in the Constitution, which became our binding positive law after the Revolution, a right to overthrow our own government. Our Constitution, when you think about it, does not even guarantee the right to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience to make reform. As Dr. King and Bob Moses and my late colleague John Lewis learned from the inside of many a jail cell, much less does it guarantee the right to engage in violent civil disobedience to make revolution. If the U.S. government were to engage in real tyranny, like slaughtering and oppressing the population, the people would have a natural right 
after such abuses and usurpations to proclaim our cause to the world, to cut the ties that bind, and engage in the same kind of revolutionary struggle that our uh, forebears did in the 18th century. But it would be meaningless and silly to argue that the Constitution itself grants us the right to do that in the face of the entire architecture of the Constitution opposing insurrection, rebellion, and domestic violence. As historian Gary Wills long ago explained, a people can overthrow a government it considers unjust, but it is absurd to think that it does so by virtue of that unjust government's own authority. The appeal to heaven is an appeal away from the earthly authority of the moment, not to that authority. In his first inaugural address, President Lincoln stated that should the people grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it or their revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it. But the revolutionary right is by definition not a constitutional right because, as Lincoln put it, quote, no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination, it being impossible to destroy it except by some action not provided for in the instrument itself. The phony insurrectionary theory allows the far right to suggest that the mass destructive violence of January 6th was something other than criminal. But the way that we pursue legitimate grievances about elections in our country is through the law, through the courts. Trump and his followers brought more than 60 lawsuits that were heard and rejected by courts all over the land. They should have taken these losses as proof that no one was buying their big lie and they should have gone home. Or if they really believed the courts were stacked against them, even though Trump's claims failed with at least eight judges that he himself nominated to the federal bench, then the kind of nonviolent civil disobedience Dr. King practiced was surely an option. After all, unlike Trump, the civil rights movement did face biased judges in huge parts of the country who ignored the facts of segregation and racial violence while betraying the purposes of equal protection and due process. But that kind of direct nonviolent action requires sustained, collective, nonviolent discipline, an appeal to the truth, a spirit of sacrifice and love rather than violent hatred of democracy. Nonviolent, conscientious civil disobedience to demand equal rights has a pretty good track record of success in America, while bloody insurrection to stage a coup has a miserable record of failure. Many of my colleagues have taken to describing the January 6th defendants as political prisoners, but being convicted for smashing a police officer over the head with a Confederate battle flag while you storm the Capitol hardly makes you a political prisoner like Andrei Sakharov or Alexei Navalny or Nelson Mandela, people in prison for standing up for human rights and democracy against authoritarianism and totalitarianism. I was, I was thrilled to see what federal judge Amit Mehta had to say upon sentencing insurrectionist Peter Schwartz, who violently assaulted several police officers to, when he sentenced him to 14 years in prison, he said, you are not a political prisoner, Mr. Schwartz. You are not Alexei Navalny. And that he certainly is not. And yet, the former president repeatedly dangles and promises pardons, full pardons, for all of the January 6th defendants. The violent assailants, the seditious conspiracists, everyone who tried to overthrow the 2020 election in the government. And Trump says he would throw in an apology, too. He also recently predicted that the upshot of any criminal indictment he faces will be death and destruction, further extending the violent chaos that he wants to inject into normal political and legal processes. You can see the nearly clairvoyant wisdom of the framers of the 14th Amendment, who insisted that future public office be foreclosed to office holders who would dare to foment insurrection against our own government. All of the rhetoric of insurrection is turning more dangerous in our hair-trigger culture of fast and loose gun violence. 
In last year's election, one candidate for Congress in Florida, Martin Hyde, uploaded a video on YouTube in which he wished that the FBI agents who arrived at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home with a search warrant had come to his house. I wish they'd turn up at my home, he reportedly said, because they'd have gone home in a body bag. But threats to law enforcement aside, the fraudulent constitutional philosophy of insurrectionism is already exacting a brutal toll on the American people and our social contract by blockading reasonable and perfectly constitutional gun safety measures. The whole purpose of the social contract, whether you're reading Thomas Hobbes or John Locke, is to make ourselves safer than we would be in a lawless state of nature, which Hobbes, of course, famously described as a state of war. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And yet, our insurrectionist caucus has brought gruesome episodes of high-tech military violence into daily life across the country. In 2023, in this year, we've had 128 days and 202 mass shootings against our people. When the insurrectionists tell us that the day of a massacre is, quote, too early to discuss policy change, they are telling us it is always too early to discuss policy, policy change because every day now is a day of massacre. The insurrectionary theorists seek to normalize the gun violence, which makes us an absolute outlier among industrialized nations, even though there's so much effective policy change we can make that is totally constitutional and heavily favored by the public. The Supreme Court has never struck down universal background checks on firearm purchasers, has never struck down outright bans on the sale and possession of military-style assault weapons or red flag laws, and yet my colleagues will immediately describe all of them as violations of the Second Amendment because they believe the purpose of the Second Amendment is to keep the public armed to the teeth so we can overthrow the government whenever we need to. With gun violence out of control in the country, propaganda and disinformation permeating large parts of the media, and routine political attacks leveled against the FBI and other legitimate law enforcement entities, we must defend our democracy, our Constitution, and our people with everything we have. The great American majority, which favors not only the rule of law, but universal criminal background checks and a ban on assault weapons must make it plain to insurrectionary apologists in Congress and all the extremist groups how our Constitution and how our, and our, our society work. There is no lawful right to overthrow our own government, attack our police, or obstruct the counting of votes in the United States of America. The alleged rights of insurrection and sedition do not exist in the Second Amendment or anywhere else. We are governed here by the Constitution and the nonviolent social contract arising under it. It is time for all of us to reassert the primacy of the real Constitution as a searchlight and an agent of democratic progress against the dark nihilism and insurrectionism of our times. Thank you very much. Thank you.